really excited to see all the the people who are attending here and um you know i think the point of my talk is to really tee up the rest of the day and so i just want to give you kind of an introduction to Perlmutter, why we're kind of uh, using GPUs and just some of the really high level GPU um, uh, kind of technology features and and uh, top level considerations that you need to kind of think about as you're moving your application over to, to, to GPUs and also kind of end with some of the progress that we've been making um, with applications that we've been working with um on porting or optimizing their their codes for for gpu systems um so this is kind of a picture of NERSC's uh roadmap um in terms of systems that we've been deploying so if you go back to NERSC 7 which was the edison system you see kind of a traditional multi-core um uh Intel Xeon powered uh, HPC architecture. Uh, at, as we deployed Cori, I think we started this transition towards exascale energy efficient type architectures. And so Cori was powered by the many core um, Intel Knights Landing Xeon Phi processors. And with Nurse 9, we're deploying, we have deployed, I guess, our first uh, CPU GPU uh, accelerated HPC architecture. And um, you can see that uh, Nurse 10 is expected to be our first sort of like exascale um, class system arriving in you know, the 2024, maybe 2025 timeframe. Um, in terms of the greater kind of DOE HPC ecosystem within the Office of Science, you can see that uh, GPUs are really beginning to play an important role. Um, so with Summit at the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, there is already a CPU plus GPU system powered by the NVIDIA Volta GPUs. Um, with Perlmutter, of course, we're using the NVIDIA Ampere, the next generation of GPUs. And the next generation of systems coming to the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility and Oak Ridge Leadership Facility will also uh, sport GPUs from um, Intel as well as uh, AM, AMD GPUs at the Oak Ridge Facility. Um, so why is this happening? And I, I, you know, I think that the short answer is um, it allows us to deliver more capability in um, terms of overall flops and memory bandwidth and um, you know, operations per, per second for, for kind of less power. So here's an example of an application running on Edison versus, versus Summit. And on the y-axis, you have time. On the uh, x-axis, you have power. And so time times power is, is energy. And so you can see as you're kind of moving down the diagonal, then you're improving on energy, energy efficiency. Um, and what you're seeing is the same application running on Edison, sort of that traditional CPU uh, multi-core um, uh, architecture versus Summit at, at Oak Ridge, the GPU architecture. And you can see that it's essentially sort of like an order of magnitude improvement that you're getting by using the, the accelerators. Um, and so as I mentioned, this change has kind of arrived um, and it's really kind of driven by the power consumption towards these, these lightweight cores. And so, you know, I think we found that Cori using the many core architecture has been kind of a boon because of this, the, the kind of new capabilities and this continues with um, the, the GPU architectures on, uh, on Perlmutter. Um, so one of the things I kind of want to highlight uh, in this slide is uh, what are the kind of the main concepts that you need to think about when programming for GPUs, in particular, the, the A100 GPUs. Um, and I'm going to start with kind of two main concepts that I think if you 
gather those, I think you kind of have have got what most of what you you need to understand about GPUs, and then we'll talk about a couple a couple other concepts as well. So one, and I think this is probably really the most important, is that you need lots and lots of parallelism. Um, so if you compare the going from kind of like the CPU architecture that um, we have sort of on like the Corey Haswell system um, to the GPU architecture on Perlmutter. You're going from 64 cores, um, uh, well, I guess uh, this, this might have been for KNL, I guess for, for Haswell, you're doing 32 cores um, to what you might consider 108 SMs on a, on a GPU socket. So uh, 108, what we call streaming multiprocessors um each of a has each of the Haswell cores can uh, handle kind of two hyper threads this is sort of equivalent on the GPU to having 64 warps that are available per SM um two can really be active at a time but you can actually kind of oversubscribe them to get additional levels of performance um to get really the most out of a Haswell CPU you had to think about using um, vector operations instead of um, scalar operations. So there are two, two 56 bit wide vectors. So that would be like four double precision um, uh, in instructions times, times two. Whereas uh, a GPU, you're really thinking about 32 SIMT threads uh, per warp. And you can kind of think of these as a little bit similar um, there are some important differences between what like uh, you can do in a vector instruction on the CPU versus what these uh, kind of SIMT threads can do on a, on a GPU. But you really should be kind of thinking about these as 32 operations that are kind of working on different data, but doing the same instruction every, every cycle. Um, and so, if you're think if you're talking about double precision, then you're really getting around like 2,000 way parallelism, 64 times four times uh, eight, uh, versus something like 200,000 way parallelism on a, a, a GPU. So significantly more parallelism by orders of magnitude that are necessary to really keep a GPU busy. Um, and so the you know one of the things that you can think about on the CPU are these hyper threads that help you kind of hide latency or hide different kind of uh, waiting time or stalls on the on the processor, and that's similar to the to the GPUs where you really want to kind of uh, oversubscribe the GPUs with either um, you know more warps per SM or more streams to really help hide any latency that your, that your application might, might be seeing. Um, so that, that's number one. You can see that the, the amount of parallelism has gone up by like one, um, not just one order of magnitude, but really like two or three orders of magnitude um, when moving from the kind of CPU architecture to the GPU architecture. Um, and the, the next main concept I want to talk about is that the, the GPU memory is very fast, um, and your application can really take advantage of that. Uh, but on the other hand, moving data to the GPU is, is not fast. Um, and that can often be a bottleneck. So let's, let's kind of discuss this. So if you look at the same kind of comparison between the Haswell CPU that exists on kind of like the Haswell um, nodes of Cori, you have a total of 128 gigabytes of DDR. Um, whereas the on the GPU itself on Perlmutter, on a single GPU, you have 40 gigabytes of uh, of H of HBM or high bandwidth memory. Uh, so on on has well the um, bandwidth that you can get from that memory is 128 gigabytes per second. That's pretty pretty good for a CPU of that that generation. It's a little bit faster now on some of the newer newer generation CPUs. Uh, but you can see it's a big 
big boost when you go to the the A100 GPUs. If you're utilizing that on-device memory, you can get up to you know 1500 uh, around 1500 gigabytes a second of memory memory bandwidth. Um, on the other hand, what is really slow, much slower than both of those memories, is the the PCI Express bandwidth of transferring data back and forth. Um, you can see that's sort of uh, an order of magnitude less than the than the memory bandwidths that we've been been talking about. So um, that's kind of the slowest the slowest pipe or the slowest um, data transfer speed on the on the node, and we want to um, kind of avoid moving data back and forth frequently. Um, so uh, you you know for your application to get the the best performance out of the out of the GPU, you really want to kind of keep the the data on the GPU and get the most out of that. Uh, the really high bandwidth memory and avoid moving it back and forth frequently between the CPU and the GPU, which is which is really the the, the slow part. Um, so those are really the top two concepts for um, for programming a GPU, and uh, I think everything else is sort of a second order consideration. I think if you have lots of parallelism and you realize that. Uh, kind of getting the data onto the GPU and trying to keep it there is important, then you're like 90% there in terms of CPU performance. Um, there are a number of second order considerations. So let me talk about just a few of those right now. So one is that when you're defining your kernels, and I think you'll kind of hear about this in some of the upcoming presentations, um, there is some sort of overhead in launching each of those kernels. So you don't want those kernels to be kind of really, really super short. Um, and so some techniques that you can use are like fusing short kernels together to, to, to kind of have longer execution times. And, um, you know, there's a possibility of doing things like defining CUDA graphs. If you have, if you do have a lot of really short kernels that kind of depend on each other or need to execute in a certain order, you can um, kind of tell the GPU about them ahead of time by defining the kind of a, kind of like a graph. And uh, that can help uh, eliminate some of the, the overhead of launching these, these individual kernels. Um, and then for, uh, I think, um, I mentioned that the high bandwidth memory is fast, but just like on a CPU, it's actually better to keep your data in registers, in cache, or in um, what is available on A100 called shared memory um, to keep the data even closer to the compute units when possible. So, you know, I think a lot of our applications at NERS tend to be more dependent in terms of their performance on the ability to move data quickly rather than to just compute um, uh, you know, as many flops as possible. And so keeping the data as, as fast, uh, as close to the um, compute units as possible can, can help. Um, and in particular, for many applications, we find that there's, it's important to kind of like experiment and find an optimal balance between maximizing the parallelism, which I really highlight a lot in this first point here, and uh, minimizing the amount of uh, kind of spilling of data out of the registers. So the GPU has kind of a fixed number of registers. And um, in, in some sense, the more uh, parallelism you expose or the more kind of warps you have active, the more likely it is that uh, your data might might spill from the registers, and so there is some um, experimentation that's often necessary at the kind of last level of optimizing your application to um, find that optimal that optimal balance. Okay, so I feel like uh, you know if you get number one and two, if you have that in your head, then I think you understand the most important things about programming for a GPU. Um, and then there's a number of second order considerations. These are really kind of just two big examples of them. Um, but, 
you know, these, these are the type of things that will help you kind of just tune and um, uh, really get the, the absolutely best performance that you can out of a, out of a GPU, out of a GPU system. Um, in terms of which programming models you use to kind of express these concepts, uh, you're going to hear a lot about this in the next presentation right after mine. Um, and, you know, I think the really nice thing about Perlmutter is that um, it kind of supports every different programming model uh, uh, out there for programming, for programming GPUs. We realized that a lot of our users had codes that already had GPU implementations that are maybe using CUDA or OpenACC. Um, and we wanted to kind of make sure that the system supported those well. Um, and in addition, we are supporting programming models that are maybe the primary choices for people who are targeting those uh, AMD GPUs like HIP or the Intel GPUs like DPC++ and Sickle. And those will be, uh, I mean, those are um, enabled and available to uh, to kind of execute on the on the Perlmutter system as well. Um, then we had a uh, you know particularly um, important partnership with Nvidia to enable OpenMP offloading support on Perlmutter. So one of the programming models that we really kind of pushed users to adopt when porting and optimizing their code for uh, the Cori Xeon Phi system was OpenMP because it allowed you to kind of identify and express a, another level of parallelism in your application at the, at the node level. Um, and we wanted to make sure that that was um, something that users kind of could continue to use to express parallelism when they're um, optimizing their applications for Perlmutter. And so we worked with uh, NVIDIA um, and what was the kind of PGI group to make sure that um, OpenMP offloading worked, was, was kind of supported and worked well in the OpenMP um, PGI and what is now the NVIDIA HPC compilers. And so um, this has led to the release of the OpenMP production offload compiler as of basically last April. And it continues to improve kind of with every, every release of the NVIDIA HPC SDK. Um, one of the things I really want to highlight to the, to the audience here today is um, the, the ability for essentially anyone out there who has an application that they're wanting to optimize on Perlmutter to join one of these community hackathons. Um, you know, I think hackathons have really proven to be an effective tool for um, preparing applications for not just Perlmutter, but other, other new systems. We used it a lot for Cori, and I know other centers uh, out there have used um, hackathons really effectively. And they're, they're kind of effective, um, not just because of uh, all like the technical things that you learn at a hackathon, but really just because of the sort of sociology of them. I think being surrounded by a lot of people who are doing sort of the same thing that, that you are is really um, kind of a contagious environment that uh, sort of takes you out of your day job for a couple of days to, to really focus on your on your application with um, kind of all the right experts looking over your, your shoulder. So um, go check out www.gpuhackathons.org. Um, nurse staff, I think, provided more team mentors than any other institution to these worldwide events in 2020. And it's really allowed us to reach nurse teams kind of all around the country uh, and really kind of all around the world. Um, and, you know, during the, you know, COVID pandemic, uh, these hackathons have kind of adapted from what was sort of an in-person event to um, uh, remote events. Uh, but I think they've they've managed to really to really be very um, 
useful, very profitable. And um, I think that even features of this sort of uh, remote hackathon format will end up being incorporated into future, future hackathons, even whenever we're um, kind of at a new normal beyond this pandemic. <laughs> pandemic state. But bottom line, go check out gpuhackathons.org and see if there's an event um, coming up that that you can attend. Um, there's a number of ways that we are trying to take what we've been learning working with applications, you know, partly at hackathons, partly as part of our uh, NESAP kind of partnership program and expand and deliver that to the community at, at large. So um, one of the things that we're doing is really working closely with the programming models and languages team. And I think, you're, again, you're going to hear a lot about this in the next presentation um, to make sure that our community needs are um, being um, considered and adapted as um, the kind of accelerator programming gets standardized within like the C++ and the Fortran standards, as well as um, kind of important frameworks like Cocos and OpenMP and OpenACC get um, <coughs> developed and expanded. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways that you can take advantage of Perlmutter, uh, even if you don't write your own code, is by um, utilizing the best possible um, the best possible uh, installation or uh, version of the community codes out there that are optimized for for Perlmutter. Um, so there's a number of applications that we provide on Perlmutter that um, we've worked with the developers to kind of um, improve their performance and make sure that uh, what we what we have available is um, really optimized for the for the architecture. And so these are just some of the examples of applications that that we provide. Um, checking out the nurse documentation, our different training events like like this event today, I think is a great way um, to uh, to kind of get the most out of the system. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the work that we've been doing with vendor tools and just one, one more pitch, because I think this is really one of the takeaway messages that I have for you is to check out the GPU community hackathons and see if there's one that you could, that you could attend. So these are kind of all virtual for the time being, but uh, will eventually also be back in, in person. Um, so in terms of wrapping your head around sort of the, the two and the, the four kind of um, concepts I talked about earlier for getting the most out of GPUs, um, what I think is really important is that you don't do it in a vacuum, is that you kind of use some tools to, to help you. And so, um, you know, as we're thinking about the, the optimization challenge that our teams have in porting, to, in porting and optimizing their applications for for Perlmutter, you know, I think that um, we found that they have kind of similar questions and that really what they need is kind of an absolute sense of performance when optimizing applications. And they have questions like, how do I know if my performance is good in some overall sense? Or why am I not getting the peak performance that was advertised on the page? And maybe the, <laughs> the most important question is, how do I know when to stop? Like, when is, when is my performance uh, good enough that it's not worth investing, you know, another several months of my time to, to try to improve it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've seen a, a number of presentations, I've even given a number of presentations where people uh, present a result that is something like the following, like my application is running two times faster today than it was a year ago. Um, and in some sense, that's great. You know, it's always better <laughs> when your application is running faster than it was before. But in another sense, it's it's not entirely meaningful because you don't know, you know, where you stand in any kind of absolute sense. Like, uh, was the code, you know, terrible to begin with, and now it's a little <laughs> a little better, or uh, was it already great, and you're, you know, you put in some kind of like ninja hacking 
um, uh, activity to uh, to really get it to perform the, that that 2x better. So I think what's really important is to know where you're standing, in a kind of some absolute sense that can guide your um, your next steps. Um, and in particular, as you saw on the GPU, there's many potential optimization directions that you can take. So is utilizing the, the you know, high bandwidth memory what's really important for you or, or is really getting the most um, out of the, um, the, the different levels of parallelism available on the GPU what's really important. How do you know what is the limiting factor in your app's performance? And again, I think it's it's quite important for productivity to know like when when is the performance good enough and when can you when can you stop? Um, and so what we found is that uh, framing these these conversations or like framing the answers to the questions in terms of a simple performance model called the roofline model on the GPUs is a really good way uh, good way to begin thinking about it. Um, so the roof line basically tells you uh, what are the performance ceilings on the device based on the characteristics of your application. So you characterize your application on the X axis in terms of the floating point operations that it does. Um, you could also think if, if you don't have an application that does floating point operations, you could also think of it in terms of like integer operations or just other, other type of operations. Um, but you want to think about the amount of, of operations that you're doing per second uh, per the amount of data that you need to transfer from some level of the memory uh, hierarchy to the to the compute units. Um, and given that your application has this characteristic, there you then have these different ceilings that limit your performance based on um, your ability to uh, utilize different parts of the of the architecture. So this is whether your application really does floating um, or I, I guess what are called fuse multiply add operations. Um, so if you have an equal number of multiplies and adds in your in your application. Um, and the nice thing is that we worked with NVIDIA to enable this analysis uh, directly within the insight performance tool. Um, and I think you're going to hear a little bit about this next week um, at the training from uh, NVIDIA about the HPC SDK. And so you can kind of give yourself uh, an understanding of where you stand against the kind of potential of the architecture in an absolute sense by running, uh, by profiling your application with, with insight. Um, and, you know, one thing I want to highlight about this is that there's nothing yeah, here in this roofline model that, um, you know, you couldn't find in uh, different profiling tools sort of already, um, but we think it's just a really nice, clean, easy way to, to think about your performance and where you stand in an absolute sense and which directions you might be able to um, improve your performance in a in a pretty kind of quick and easy way for for everyone to um to kind of grok or understand um <clears throat> okay so uh we've been uh, working with uh pretty closely with a number of applications from a whole bunch of different different science areas and um and working with them to improve their application for the Perlmutter system. And so uh, this is a plot of where some of those applications stand from different uh, algorithmic areas um, in comparing their performance on uh, the Perlmutter system versus the, the Edison system um, on a kind of system per system um, performance, uh, performance comparison. Um, and so one of the things I just want to highlight is that uh, across all of these different applica application areas or algorithmic areas, uh, we are seeing applications that are able to achieve at least sort of a 20x system-wide throughput increase over, over Edison. Um, here are some specific applications that, we look, that we've looked at on a node-per-node -node basis. 
Um, you can see that application performance is varying anywhere from you know about 20x for some of the toughest apps to optimize on the GPU all the way up to like over a thousand, a thousand X for some of the machine learning applications that uh, are able to take advantage of some of the low precision acceleration that's available on the, the GPU suit as well. Um, so let me, I'm just gonna end my talk. I know that I'm sort of running a little bit low on time here. And so I'm gonna end my talk by showing you a few examples of what, uh, what can be done with uh, with with Perlmutter. Um, so the first application I want to talk about is DESI. So that stands for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Um, and I think this is a particular kind of app to start with because it's related to the namesake of the of the system, Perlmutter himself, who kind of discovered that um, not only is the universe expanding, but the rate of expansion is actually accelerating. And um, you know the kind of the the, the term for that is uh, kind of dark dark energy, and so scientists believe that about seventy percent of the universe is dark energy, although we don't really have have a good understanding about about what that is. Um, and so the Desi instrument is going to send nurse data every night for five years, uh, and this data will kind of be used to construct a really detailed map of the universe to better understand the nature of, of dark energy. Um, and so they've been working to accelerate the, the, the kind of key DESI data analysis pipeline uh, on, on Perlmutter. Um, and that's what you see here. So uh, they completed a kind of a major refactor um, and optimized the CPU code. Uh, with the first GPU port really coming in early 20, 2020. And so that's what you see here is the performance um, of, the, of the GPU port. Um, they continue to optimize uh, the application over uh, a series of uh, different kind of types of optimizations targeting different features of the, of the GPU. And the, and the very latest performance of the application on Perlmutter uh, has a kind of 25x improvement in per node throughput using Perlmutter compared to the to the Edison baseline or the initial the initial code on on Edison. Um, XFL so X is uh, an application that uses uh, you know HPC to analyze the data from uh, X-ray free electron lasers. Um, and I think one of the interesting things here is that this is a community who wants to um, employ kind of HPC to enable real-time data analysis to make decisions and, and analyze their data, not just after uh, kind of their beam time is over or the data collection time is over, but really during the experiment itself or during their data collection time at a at um, one of the facilities that um, provides these X-ray free electron lasers. Um, so they really used um, uh, the GPU systems at NERSC to develop now a highly scalable application that uh, analyzes these uh, X-ray diffraction patterns uh, with a runtime that's really improved by many orders of magnitude. So something that would take 12 you know, 12 hours on Edison is now on the order of two minutes on a, <laughs> a, a Perlmutter node. Um, and you can see that they're, they're, they've also been working a lot on the, the scaling across, uh, across GPU nodes on the, on the system. Um, another example is LAMPS. So LAMPS does molecular dynamics calculations. So basically, molecules kind of interacting with each other, atoms atoms and molecules interacting with each other and um, uh, kind of moving around over time or uh, evolving over time. And so um, this was an application that had an existing GPU version, uh, but they've been working with NERSC. And in particular, I want to highlight the effect of the hack hackathons that they've attended um, 
in 2019 and in 2020 um, to improve their, their performance. Um, and through those efforts, largely centered around hackathons, uh, as well as working with some of the NVIDIA engineers, they've been able to get a 22x improvement in their GPU performance um, to the point where their uh, node versus node speed up uh, uh, with a new application on Perlmutter compared to kind of where they were at uh, on Edison to begin with is over 250 50x. Um, so that's a com combination of using the new system as well as the improvements that they put into the into the application. <laughs> um, and after this effort, they were really able to achieve uh, um, some, some pretty impressive runs um, on Perlmutter and other GPU systems that they couldn't have really done without all of the GPU acceleration um, and uh, improvements that they made to the, to the code. Um, and this was uh, recognized as a Gordon Bell finalist in um, SC uh, back in back in November, the supercomputing conference back in in November. <coughs> um, and I think one of the interesting things that they were able to measure is the uh, performance in term, terms of like uh, atom steps or millions of atom steps um, per GPU um, per I guess per GPU second. And so this sort of takes out the the um, the the scale factor um, and what you'd ex what you'd expect or hope to see here would be like a kind of straight line across this graph that no matter how many GPUs you use, you um, get roughly the same performance in terms of atom steps per GPU. Um, and you can see that they've use three different systems, Perlmutter, Summit, and Selene. So Perlmutter and Selene both have the latest generation A100 GPUs, whereas Summit at Oak Ridge was using the previous generation B100 GPUs. Um, and you can see that they're getting great performance on Perlmutter uh, and roughly like a 1.6x you know, speed up between the previous generation Volta GPUs and the Perlmutter A100. GPUs. Um, uh, I think I'm running a little bit low on time because I'm supposed to be finishing and maybe taking some questions here. So I'll, I'll kind of go through some of these quickly. But this is another comparison between the previous generation B100 GPU from uh, Summit and the A100 GPUs from, from Perlmutter. And again, you're seeing about a factor of 1.6 or uh, in some cases close to a factor of 2 in, in performance improvements. Um, let me just end with this last science story here, um, accelerating uh, some fluid dynamics applications with GANs on Perlmutter. So I know a number of people in the audience are probably hoping to do some machine learning, um, either training or inference on the Perlmutter system. So this is a case where a group is replacing part of a fluid dynamics simulation with a uh, with a GAN or kind of a trained neural network. Um, and, you know, one of the things I want to, to highlight is that, uh, again, we're seeing a big improvement over the previous generation of GPUs, the, B1, the B100s compared to the, to the A100s. Uh, in this case, a 2.9x performance improvement in the machine learning workflow. Um, and, uh, I think that that'll be something that a number of you see when um, you uh, kind of apply your machine learning workflows to, to Perlmutter. <clears throat> okay, so let me conclude. So I think uh, the key takeaways is that we've kind of, you know, NERSC as a whole has been successful in preparing a number of applications for, for Perlmutter. Um, one of the things I wanna highlight to this audience is that we really want to continue working with you uh, to enable the use of Perlmutter productively. And I think really, really one of the best ways of doing that is to have you all apply and join uh, these public events that are 
um, well, I guess they're virtual for now, but they're kind of being led by institutions all around the country and really all around the world. So check out gpuhackathons.org. Um, and that GPU optimizations, you know, that we talked about increasing parallelism, understanding and minimizing the, the data movement um, are things that uh, really continue on the themes from Corey and are really the most important things that you need to still think about um, when optimizing your applications for, for Perlmutter. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, I think you're going to hear a lot about a lot more about this in the next talk, but I really think that, you know, OpenMP and then these C++ frameworks, for example, are becoming viable options for you to utilize, not just uh, Perlmutter productively, but also the upcoming exascale systems at the other uh, DOE, DOE facilities. Um, so I will stop there.